Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. On May 19th, 2018, I was base fishing in a place called Camel Slough, which is part of a bigger lake named Saline Lake in DeVille, Louisiana. I have fished this lake off and on my whole life since I grew up in the area. That morning, I fished a few places, but eventually came back to the slough because I always had good luck there. I entered the slough on the right side and fished all the way down into the back channel and then came back up the left side and around this old cypress tree on the corner, which has a platform built in it from old duck hunters. I made a loop around the tree, casting in various spots, and then continued down the bank toward this old T-shaped dock, which has been there for years as well. Behind the dock, there is an old abandoned camp, which sits about 60 yards back in the trees. As I neared the right side of the T-shaped dock, I looked down to adjust my foot on my trolling motor pedals, so to angle around the dock as I made one last cast at the inside corner, when suddenly I heard a loud splashing to my left on the other side of the dock. My initial thought was a gator, but to my surprise, as I look over, I see a five-foot-tall bipedal run out of the water up the slight embankment and into the trees to the left of camp. For a second, I was stunned, but then quickly, my brain rushed and said, wait, what if there's more, or possibly a bigger one still in the water, waiting to grab me off this boat? So, I threw my pole into the bottom of the boat, kicked my tackle box out the way, and cranked the boat just as he was disappearing into the trees. I hauled butt back to the boat dock where I fished for another two hours in sight of other people before I left. But, I note, that as it ran up the hill, it slipped, and when it did, it reached down with its right hand to balance itself and get its footing. I got a very good look at its hand when it reached and noticed it was as human-looking as mine, except for the backhand was hairy as the rest of its body. However, its fingers and palm were like mine, except a few shades darker, its fur appeared to be about three inches long. It was wet from the neck down. The wet body just looked black from being wet, but the neck and head was dry and very cinnamon colored. I don't recall seeing a face, but because its body was wet, I could see it wasn't super muscular. It had the build of a high school athlete, but not huge. I assume had its hair been dry, it would have been a lot thicker looking of a build, but wet is how I saw it. I would say the entire sighting lasted roughly five seconds from splash to disappearance. I have not been back to the spot since. I kick myself for not getting the prints off the bank, but I was scared blankless at the time. Since then, I've moved from there and have no access to do further research. I've honestly only told a few people until now for fear that someone would try to hunt and possibly kill it. But after so many years, I'd say it's time to speak for research purposes. I know what I saw was a Sasquatch. My ultimate question is, what was it doing in the water? Did I sneak up on it as it was bathing? Or had it swam from the other side and crossed as I was coming down the bank? Was it rushing to reach the bank before I got there, or was it merely playing in the water? If it was swimming, it was the quietest swim ever, or it was waiting on me, and my sudden shift and boat maneuver scared it into running. I believe it to be a juvenile, one compared to stories I've heard about others being eight-footers. I've heard stories about boaters going missing, and it really makes me think. 
I often think about it and what its true intentions were in the water that day before I scared it off. On to the next one. Near Hope in British Columbia. Hello there. I would like to share with you an experience I had regarding a creature in whose existence that, up to that time, I was extremely skeptical of, to say the least. I am no longer a skeptic. In fact, I am now a true believer in the ever-elusive ape-man creature of the Pacific Northwest known as Sasquatch. Picture this. I am driving from Hope to Princeton with my sister and friend. And about this time of year, January, there is a wisp of very dry snow blowing low across the road in front of us. It is about 3 a.m., not a house or a light or a car around for miles, and one of those nights that is so cold that a person wouldn't want to stop on the side of the road to relieve themselves for fear of turning into a human ice cube. One thing for sure as there is no snowballs in hell, and that is we are not apt to see some fool out here at this time of night, in this kind of cold, and in this isolated location running around in a monkey suit. What happened next is etched into my mind for all time. A creature, definitely not a bear, and even more definitely not a human, walking across the road from left to right. Starting from the time it came into view of my headlight until it went out of view of my light was about six to eight seconds. I stopped right where I thought the exact spot was that he crossed. We saw no more of him. I, needless to say, did not get out to investigate this creature as I was riveted with a combination of fear and a strange sense of almost giddy euphoria of a nature that is hard to describe. We sat there for a few minutes asking each other if we actually saw what we saw or were we all crazy. We decided finally to believe that we saw what we saw and what we saw was a creature well over the height of a tall man, say seven to eight feet, kind of grayish in color with very long arms, a thick torso, a slanted back, ape-like forehead, and walking with long, deliberate-like strides. At one point, he turned in our direction, but not as a person would, by merely turning the head, but by turning the upper part of the body as well. The only video I have of this is stored in the memory of my mind. I would like to say, only to the few people out there that have had an experience like mine, that my heart goes out to you in the knowledge that, like me, you can't share it with your friends or family or anyone because you know that even if they tell you that they believe what you say you saw, you know deep inside that they do not. Oh well, I don't begrudge these people because I know that, being a skeptic myself, and if the tables were turned, I would be and was a non-believer. Now I do believe. On to the next one. This was near Rossland in British Columbia. My brother, his girlfriend, myself, and a friend of mine left Rossland in the early evening. Our idea being to go watch for UFOs on the top of the summit. I was 17 years old at the time. It was on what we called the Summit Road, Old Rossland Cascade Highway a dirt road with many hairpin turns twisting up along the side of two mountains to the summit. My sighting of Bigfoot was quick, but enough for me to know exactly what I was looking at. I saw all of him initially. It was gray-colored. Then, mostly, I saw his back and legs. The hair seemed coarse and thick. He also seemed more slender than I would have thought. He was tall, though, very tall. I'm not good at guessing height, but if the bank was any indication, I guess he'd be about seven feet at least. He was bent over the creek, and I assume he'd been drinking water. He stood, turned, took one long stride toward the hillside, then stepped up a dirt bank and was gone up into the trees 
and shadows within moments. All this took place within the glow of the car headlight. For a moment, I couldn't take it all in, and then heard my friend, also in the back seat, sobbing beside me. All I said to her was, did you see what I saw? All I heard was her shaky voice whispering, yes. She was very frightened. I think I recall her saying, what was that? My brother and his girlfriend in the front seat with my brother driving never saw the Bigfoot because he was readying for the hairpin corner and was looking in that direction and not straight ahead where the headlights shone in the moment. His girlfriend was talking quietly and looking at him, so she never saw anything either. The next day, we went back up there to look for any kind of sign, but it being fall, frost had hardened the ground. We were stunned when we saw how high the bank was he had easily stepped over into maybe five foot. The bank was sloped steeply, dirt with some rocks, grasses, and trees and brush at the top. We found no footprint. Though it was quick, I will never forget what I saw. I can still see it in my mind's eye. We saw nothing else at that time, but we went back up the next day to look for print, but found none. The ground had been frozen the night before. It was early evening, around 7.30 p.m. or so, but I can't recall exactly. It was a clear evening, crisp. Frost was just beginning to happen at night, about the end of September and early October. It was a steep mountainside. The sighting happened at a sharp hairpin corner with a creek crossing at the point of the hairpin and running under a small bridge or culvert. Steep banks up either side of the creek, though where I saw the Sasquatch, there was a small flat area on the right of the creek before the bank that he stepped up on. It is thick forest and brush. Once some people knew about what I saw, a couple of folks began to tell me stories as well of their own sightings, though now I can only remember two that stand out clear enough. These were sightings all around Rossland. One sighting stood out. One local who was out hunting with a friend, they had shot a deer, gutted it, then strung it up with a rope high in a tree so a bear wouldn't get to it. They had to walk back up to their truck. As they were driving toward where the deer was, they saw a Sasquatch reach up easily and pull the deer down. They were scared, turned around, and drove back home. Another report was one of a woman who knew who lived outside of town at the base of the mountain. She apparently called the police one night, very upset that she could see a tall creature standing under her streetlight in the yard. She was apparently distraught, and from what I can recall, it had not been the first time she had seen them. On to the next one. One summer, back in the late 90s, my father decided to surprise our family with an end-of-summer vacation in a Wisconsin town called Rhinelander. It's a picturesque town in the northern part of the state that's full of lakes. I don't think an overwhelming number of people know about it, so it's probably an advantageous spot for a cryptid to go undetected. My parents rented this cozy cabin on a lake that I can't remember the name of, but it seemed like the entire perimeter was comprised of lush forest and log cabins. Every one of them had a dock with at least a rowboat parked beside it. Right next to our rental was another family who had just purchased their lakefront home. There was a really pretty girl named Emily who happened to be around my age. Our dad got into a long conversation the first night, which led to the rest of us quickly getting to know each other. I didn't want to admit it at the time, but I had an instant crush on Emily. I remember how I was trying to act calm and cool in her presence, pretending like her pretty face didn't faze me. Daniel, my older brother, even commented on how I was attempting to deepen my voice whenever Emily was around. That's pretty embarrassing. Of course, I aggressively denied it. One afternoon, I was fishing off the pier when Emily came over and asked me if I wanted to go for a walk on a nearby trail. Again, I tried to act relaxed, 
Like, I wasn't very interested, but I was ecstatic. If I remember correctly, the trail was known for frequent use by mountain bikes and dirt bikes and ATVs. When we first entered the woods, the environment was so peaceful. I had been so distracted trying to smooth talk Emily that I failed to notice when any of that shifted. At the time, I assumed it was because there was a lack of sunlight piercing the spaces between the thick trees, but Emily mentioned how she was abruptly feeling freezing. It was at that same time that she said this that I also noticed something was off, and I mean very off. There wasn't any noise that warned me to do so, but I somehow knew to look behind me. At first, I thought it was a large bear covered in leaves. It was creeping towards us on all fours, so the last thing I was expecting was any human-like trait. But then I soon noticed it had a mud-covered face, and that face, it looked like a man's face. It looked like it had a beard and a mustache, but it was hard to ascertain the skin color behind the dark hair because of how dirty it appeared. Another thing that I immediately noticed was how its feet seemed to slide effortlessly into the ground. I still don't know if that was because it was a derivative of its immense weight or if it possessed claws that easily penetrated the dirt. There was something so gripping about the strangeness of the whole thing, but it still wasn't enough to prevent my will to run. However, it wasn't until I had made it maybe a hundred yards up the trail that I noticed Emily wasn't by my side. She was nowhere in sight. I wasn't sure how to proceed because I didn't want to call her name and I didn't want to run back to where I'd just seen that strange beast. The only remotely comforting aspect of the situation was I hadn't heard Emily scream out at any point. Not long after that, a middle-aged guy approached me on his mountain bike. He was coming from the opposite direction of where Emily and I encountered the beast. I was too shaken to initiate any dialogue with him, but I'm guessing he pulled over because he either saw the expression on my face or he could sense my unsettled energy. He asked me if everything was okay, and I found it challenging to get words out because I wasn't sure where to start. I remember having trouble deciding whether first to tell him that I lost my friend or tell him that I saw something the size of a large bear, but with a human face. For some strange reason, I was such a nervous wreck that I ended up telling the man that I was fine, and before I knew it, he was out of sight. I guess it was because he was headed in that direction that I felt more comfortable to trail him. If he yelled out in terror, it would be enough warning for me to run in the opposite direction. Still, I took it slow and steady, and soon I ended up at the trailhead. As far as I could tell, there was no trace of Emily or the beast. So, I kept walking until I was back at our cabin. I didn't have a cell phone back then, so it's not like I could have called the police even if I wanted to. There was still plenty of daylight by the time I made it back to the cabin, and my family members were still enjoying the outdoors. My mom was chatting with Emily's mom, so I walked straight over to them and informed them how we got separated on the trail. When I told her that we were approached by a strange, dirty man crawling around on all fours, Emily's mom dropped her drink. I must have been pretty convincing because she ran for a telephone to call the police. When the police officers questioned me, I got the distinct impression that they suspected what happened to Emily. It was like they knew what I was talking about when I mentioned a large, dirty man crawling around on the forest floor. Of course, they never admitted it, which no longer surprises me in any sense. As far as I know, Emily was never found. What's even more mysterious is that there was never any mention in the newspapers regarding the missing girl. Even if the media didn't mention a Sasquatch, I expected at least a statement of the missing child. This world is utterly bizarre. On to the next one. I was going through a difficult time in my life. 
primarily because my ex-wife and I had recently filed for divorce and I was overly nervous about what the settlement was going to look like. My best friend, Chris, organized a camping excursion for him, me, and a mutual friend, Brandon, to boost my spirit. I can't remember the exact name of the park we were in, but it was within close proximity to Mount Rainier. I was living in Seattle, so the drive there wasn't bad at all. The trip started off being the perfect thing to ease my sorrow. I remember thinking it had felt like years since I got any fun. When I wasn't at work, I had been glued to the computer and the telephone reviewing divorce-related documents. Camping was the perfect medicine that I didn't even know I needed. That was, of course, before the horror began. Since we weren't at a designated campground, it felt like the first time I had truly immersed myself in the wild. We got a nice little spot on a riverbank, and I don't think I had ever been to a more therapeutic location. The sound of the flowing river was so effective for helping me to organize my scrambled thoughts. There was no picnic table, no firing, and nobody else around for what we had hoped to be miles. It's so much better to camp at a place like that because then you don't have to listen to someone's crappy music played on some even crappier speakers all night. It's remarkable how many people show up at places like that and seem to do all they can to cope with a natural environment. It defeats the whole purpose of going there in the first place. But little did I ever expect for there to be consequences for camping in the middle of nowhere. I was never afraid of bears, cougars, or wolves, so I assumed we wouldn't have to deal with any danger. I sure was unprepared for what would come. It was the first night of the two-day trip that we all peacefully fell asleep in our personal tent. The three tents formed a triangle around the area where we had constructed a fire pit with several large stones. As soon as we stopped talking and got into our sleeping bags, the environment seemed to become so rich with nature's noises. It made me feel like I was in the Amazon rainforest. I had a lot of trouble falling asleep and I now believe it's because of the unsettling feeling that washed over me. I remember suddenly feeling like we shouldn't be out there, but I couldn't for the life of me justify why. I remember telling myself that I was acting like a scared child and needed to grow a pair. I was 31 years old, so I felt I had no excuse to let myself be afraid of the woods. But when I heard a series of odd breaths coming from somewhere behind the tent, I wondered whether there was more to my trepidation than I initially thought. The breathing seemed to come out of nowhere. It was like there was suddenly a large man with damaged lungs struggling to get oxygen right outside my tent. It was so freaky because I right away knew neither Chris nor Brandon's voices sounded like this thing. It was far too deep and raspy. Even though I had never heard anything quite like it, it sounded big. I was too intimidated to say anything, so I continued to lay on my side, waiting for one of my friends to inform us of what was near. But nobody said a word. This thing continued to breathe heavily right next to my tent. I decided it had to be an ordinary but curious animal that would soon trot off after realizing there wasn't anything near my tent. We were cautious and made sure to put every edible and or scented item inside a container that we hung from a tree. So I couldn't figure out what the heck the animal was doing by continuing to linger. I'm not sure how long it was before then, but I soon got this feeling that I needed to get out of there, and I needed to warn my friends in case they were somehow still sleeping. But 
there was another feeling that alerted me to remain inside my tent and stay as quiet as possible. I would have given anything to disappear from that scene at that moment and go anywhere else. While I laid there, doing all I could to prevent any of my muscles from twitching, the strange breaths sounded as though they were getting further away. I began to feel a bit of relief. Then, completely out of nowhere, the zipper started to open. At first, I figured it had to be either Chris or Brandon rushing in to tell me what they had just observed outside the tent. But the interior was illuminated just enough for me to see the strangest-looking, most enormous hand I had ever laid eyes upon. I barely had time to react before it grabbed onto the lower portion of my sleeping bag and eventually wrapped its fingers around my left calf. I can't begin to express how glad I am to have had a knife next to my sleeping bag. It was what I had used to sharpen a stick that I had used to cook a couple of wieners over the campfire earlier that night. I squirmed around, desperate to climb out of the animal's grasp, but it was no use. It was far too strong. It looked like it was leaning its other shoulder into the tent, which caused the flap to open further. I think it was amid inserting its other arm inside there to obtain a better grip. That was when I landed a direct jab of what felt like a very muscular forearm. That was when this animal wailed just like a woman with a megaphone. I don't know if it was because it was so close to me, but something about it sounded somewhat electric or mechanical. It was the most peculiar noise and it felt harmful to my ears. After one more swipe from the knife, the animal propelled itself out of my tent, leaving the flap ajar. I was left staring at the combination of the trees and starlit sky. My heart felt as though it were going to thump out of my chest. I tried to call out for Chris and Brandon to find out whether they had witnessed any of that, but it was like I couldn't make my voice loud enough. I was glad to see both of their tents appeared to be untouched. I hadn't heard any commotion before the heavy breaths entered the area, so I was confident my friends were okay. After a few moments, Brandon mustered up enough courage to call out to the both of us, asking if we were all right. When they exited their tents, the dim light enabled me to see their facial expressions, but... I could feel their astonishment. What was that thing? They both asked in their own words. I don't know, but I jabbed it a couple of times with my knife, I said, still trying to regain my composure. Why did it suddenly sound like a terrified woman had entered our camp? Brandon asked, mystified. It was so difficult to come to terms with what had just happened. I kept waiting for someone to tell me I had dreamt the whole thing but my friends continued to stare at me, awaiting a logical explanation for whatever had just occurred. I couldn't give them one. For some reason, I wasn't too worried about the animal returning, and I can't help but wonder whether that feeling was derivative of it fleeing the vicinity. Throughout the years, I've seen many other accounts that claim this species exposes a primitive sense of fear in us that warns us they're near. My theory is that the Bigfoot species is an ancient ancestor that probably used to hunt us and consume us. What other reason could there be for evoking such fear? Sure, there are common fear of the unknown that I think we all have to some degree, but this feeling far exceeded anything like that. The fire was easy to rekindle, and the three of us stood around it for hours, constantly scanning our surroundings. Even though not one of us got a look at the animal's face, I was very confident that it was a Bigfoot that reached into my tent that night. There's just no other explanation. Neither Chris nor Brandon debated it. They knew damn well, just off the noises, that it was no ordinary animal. You'd probably be surprised to hear that we camped another night after that but we did move to a different location. 
Thankfully, nothing out of the ordinary occurred. My leg was a bit bruised from the animal's grip, but I just felt lucky it wasn't broken or worse, removed. I had expected to find at least a few drops of blood on my sleeping bag or tent, but I couldn't find anything, not even a single hair. The animal must have fled before any fluids could drip from its skin. I'm near positive I encountered a Bigfoot, and I'll forever wonder whether it was a male or a female. The initial raspy breathing sounded male, but the scream sounded female. Also, what did it want with me? It's unsettling as can be to suspect that it approached me for nourishment. Not to brag, but I pat myself on the back for having the guts to stick it out in the woods for one more night after that. On to the next one. If you've ever visited Blue Ridge, Georgia, you can probably picture how it would be a near-perfect area for the rarest creatures to thrive. With a population of under 1,200, it would be pretty dang easy to remain hidden from most citizens. This whole thing happened in 2004, and I had just graduated from the University of Florida along with my girlfriend, Mandy. Mandy's family spent most of the year in Blue Ridge, and we decided to go on a road trip to see them. I had never been there before, but I immediately thought it was a very wholesome countryside town. I say that because I never would have imagined I was in for the scare of a lifetime. The morning after the night we arrived, Mandy's mother, Donna, asked me to go for a ride with her to the local farmer's market. I felt sort of awkward since the woman was a bit weird, but I didn't want to insult anyone. She just always had this stoic expression. It seemed to stay that way even when she occasionally laughed. I guess that's just how it was shaped, unfortunately. The car ride got even weirder when Donna decided to bring up the idea of me marrying her daughter. Mandy and I hadn't even been together for a year and a half, and I wasn't confident about what I was going to do with my career or even where I wanted to move. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology, so I had quite a few options. I could try to get an internship somewhere or continue my education. I bring up that conversation because I've always felt like it was such a pivotal moment for me and it helped me realize I wasn't as committed to Mandy as everyone else seemed to hope. And that was all so soon before yet another pivotal moment for me. While Donna and I were driving home from the market, she slammed on the brakes. I remember so vividly I was admiring a beautiful piece of farmland when the side of my head nearly hit the windshield. Oh my, the middle-aged woman yelled out, before I spun my gaze forward. About 40 feet in front of the car was what looked like a dark orangutan moseying across the rural road. It wasn't overly tall, probably somewhere within the realm of six feet. The sun seemed to reflect off of it, but its fur looked to be a combination of black, gray, and a little bit of white beneath its chin. As I stared at this thing, I thought I was going insane. It just didn't make any sense. Donna scrambled to pull her phone from her purse, which must have had some crappy pixelated camera, but she was far too slow. The ape-like creature didn't seem like it was any major rush, but it was only maybe seven or eight seconds before it was entirely out of sight and in the woods on the other side of the street. I don't know how long the two of us sat in the car, waiting for the creature to reemerge, but we were silent the whole time. There were no other cars in sight, so it was probably one of the most covert areas to cross on the road. Of course, I had already heard of Bigfoot, but I hadn't heard of the southern version commonly referred to as the skunk ape or swamp ape. As the creature crossed the road, it didn't seem to make any noise, and I could tell it was very agile, making it even easier to remain undetected. When we eventually continued on our way home, Donna 
breath that she thought it was an ape that escaped from the zoo. Sure, there was some resemblances to an orangutan, but it was still darn clear that this was no average ape. The lady wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, so I'll cut her some slack. I don't know what to say, other than it was very clearly half-human, half-ape. There was something about its body language that emphasized human characteristics. I know some people catch a lot of heat for claiming to have any sort of certainty about these things, but I'm staying firm with that single aspect. I have complete confidence that this creature was a descendant of some humanoid that long ago resided in the continent's warmer regions. The thing I don't understand is why there's such a blatant attempt by mainstream science to discredit the subject. Why is it that the media has strived for so long to turn Bigfoot into a total joke? These creatures are as real as anything, and I'll even go as far as to say that we should sue the government for withholding this information from the public. I hope that happens one day. Neither Mandy nor her father Gary seemed to believe my version of the story. I think it was a lot simpler for them to go along with Donna's impression that it was some rogue ape from a zoo. I can't say I found the whole experience overly scary, but I think part of that was because I felt safe inside the car. If I had been out walking and the creature was a lot closer, I'm sure it would have been a much different story. There's no question in my mind that the creature could have torn me apart if it desired. On to the next one. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!